I'd also like to now invite Sir Michael Hurst, the Global President of the International Diabetes Federation, to talk to us from one of our member organisations and a strong patient perspective about universal health coverage. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here this morning to be able to tell you something about how the International Diabetes Federation uh, is endeavouring uh, to put patients first, to make sure that the voice of the person with diabetes is driving our advocacy work at local, local national, regional and global levels. But first, perhaps I should explain to you um, that I became a patient champion by accident. Uh, it happened after the diagnosis of my youngest child with di diabetes at the age of four. And um, it happened when my wife and I were summoned and given a glass syringe and shown how we should be injecting her daily with insulin. And as I struggled to get my fingers round this glass syringe, with the needle that required to be sharpened every so often, I said, surely there's an easier way to do it. And they said, yes, there is. You can buy disposable syringes. Uh, they're lighter, they're smaller. Uh, and I thought that in years to come, as my daughter would have to learn to manage her own uh, disease of diabetes, I thought that that was a, a preferred alternative. And I was horrified then to be told, ah, but you have to pay for them. Now, I had a slight advantage because I was then a member of parliament. So I had access to policymakers. But I discovered that the brick wall of officialdom is a very difficult one to penetrate. A treasury, a finance department that says we don't have the money, a health department that says we can't do this for diabetes because we'd have to do that for asthma and we'd have to do the next thing for another chronic disease. So eventually, uh, having seen the government introduce free needles for drug addicts in order to curtail the spread of HIV, a policy which I believed was pragmatic and sensible, but deny disposable syringes to people with diabetes, my sense of fairness was affronted. And I went to the Prime Minister and I argued my case with no little passion, explaining to her that I wasn't here on my own behalf, I was there as the voice of the voiceless, the people who didn't have access, but the people whose need was there. And I have to say to her immense credit, she listened carefully to all that I had to say and uh, eventually banged heads together and disposable syringes uh, were then available on, uh, on prescription. And because the health department had stupidly overestimated the cost of it, uh, there was plenty of money left for blood glucose monitoring equipment uh, a few months later. Uh, but first, perhaps, may I just explain a little bit about the disease of diabetes and why it poses particular challenges to the International Diabetes Federation as we seek to champion the rights of those with diabetes. Our guiding principle is absolutely simple. It is to improve the lives of people with diabetes in whatever way possible. And that is what drives our activity uh, within the Federation. Unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, diabetes is a huge and growing problem. It's rising in every country in the world. As you can see, the estimated total of people with diabetes in October 2013 was 382 million. Unless there are major changes in policy and practice in the next 20 years, it will rise to 592 million. And you can see that in fact, uh, it's rising everywhere, but in some continents, it's rising faster than elsewhere. Uh, don't think that Europe's got it cracked because uh, its projected increase is a lower percentage. In fact, all that it is, it's got more sophisticated health systems which have, already, uh, uh, which have already diagnosed them. But you can see there the huge, the colossal burden that there is 
in the Western Pacific with China as the big figure there. You can see also uh, in, in South India, in Southeast Asia, uh, the Indian figures which, which swell the number there. But actually, diabetes is worse than it appears because the figures I showed in the last slide are those who are estimated to have diabetes. But diabetes is not something that just happens like that. It's a disease which takes a number of years to develop. And typically, it may be between 8 and 12 years from the point of inception of the disease until the point of diagnosis. So the pre-diabetes stage uh, shows, is the second line there. And you can see that in addition to the 382 million people, there's another 300 million people who are at pre-diabetes stage. Total, almost 700 million people. Fast forward 20 years, and we have over 1 billion people who will have diabetes or who will be at serious risk of developing it. One in eight of the citizens on this globe will have the shadow of diabetes living over them. It's a colossal burden. It's a colossal burden to health services in their costs. And, and once you start talking about the cost of 550 billion US dollars, people's eyes just, they, 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 they lose focus there. Let me put to you a rather more chilling statistic about the burden of diabetes globally. There's one new case every three seconds. And every six seconds, someone somewhere in the world is dying from the complications of diabetes, dying prematurely. Every 20 seconds, someone is losing a limb because of diabetes. And that doesn't include all those who may die of end-stage renal failure or who may lose their sight. And in far too many countries, the disabling complications of diabetes mean the destruction of the living standards of the breadwinner and his or her family, condemning their, that person's family to a life of poverty and continuing the dreadful cycle. That shows also what an unfair and unequal world we have. The huge sum that's spent in North America on diabetes, the tiny sum that's spent on sub-Saharan Africa. And, uh, and of course, what that means is that the people who have diabetes fail to get the care, fail to get the care that they need. But when we talk about the cost of diabetes, I always talk about the human cost as well as the money cost. The money cost there is simply the cost to health services. There's nothing in for the lost production that condemns a country to be denied the development that it so keenly wants. And there's nothing there for the human costs. Uh, this morning we had a splendid presentation in here uh, talking about the, the human cost to the person who has the disease, to the financial costs, the emotional costs, to the way in which the life of the person with the, the, the disease is actually curtailed because of it. Now, yesterday Sally Davis talked about the imperative of having strong research in order to uh, underpin uh, the advocacy of any patient organization. We produced that research in a document called a magazine called, well, it's not a magazine, it's, a, it's a, an atlas of diabetes, which contains a wealth of information about all of every country, your country and every other country in the world. It analyzes diabetes in a great deal of detail. And it's a powerful advocacy tool because it is unchallenged. It's, it's accepted as being the gold standard of information about diabetes. It lists the figures for each country. It shows the split between male and female, between those who live in rural settings and those who live in urban settings. And that's important because in rural settings, in so much of the world, the maintenance, the health, health care capacity simply doesn't exist. It projects the figures for 20 years, and that's how we, we know that uh, one billion people uh, can, will have diabetes or be at risk of developing it. And that uh, atlas 
also gives the analysis of cost of care, health care for diabetes per capita in all the countries of the world. And I've picked two of the figures there. In Ethiopia, it's $29 a year. In Germany, it's over $4,700 a year. So you can see that if um, fate destines you to have diabetes in Germany, you will have infinitely better care than you can have if you live uh, in Ethiopia. And of course, that is the burden of diabetes falling in the most inequitable way possible. And one of the reasons why IDF uh, unashamedly and with absolute passion will call for universal health coverage to be recognized as a primary human right. It's not a privilege, it's a right, and we shouldn't be ashamed for calling it such. We are, of course, a campaigning organization, and that is why uh, our atlas is an important weapon in that, uh, in that uh, work and campaigning. Uh, I was just in a quiet backwater serving as chairman of Diabetes UK, which is one of the founder members of IDF, when I got a call asking me to be involved in the campaign for a United Nations resolution on diabetes. I guess it was probably my experience in politics that was seen to be helpful. But quite literally, we went to the UN missions in New York, and we knocked on the doors, and we said, we want to come and talk to you about a, a resolution that we want to bring before the General Assembly of the United Nations on diabetes. And I have to say that we got a much better hearing in those missions where the countries had a real problem of diabetes and were struggling to achieve it. We got much less of a welcome uh, among the European, uh, the EU uh, missions, among the Americans, the Brits, the Japanese, the Canadians, who just thought that we were proffering the begging bowl on behalf of low and middle income countries. And I remember some of the ambassadors saying to me, Michael, you're well intentioned, but you haven't a hope of achieving it. Well, we did achieve it. We did achieve it through sheer perseverance and by, I think, this remarkable phenomenon that you will recognize in your own patient organization. The collective determination of a number of people who can lift their eyes off the horizon, who can see a goal in life, and who are not, not prepared to be deflected from it. We always knew that a resolution wouldn't change things overnight for people with diabetes because the General Assembly simply presents it to nations and it's up to nations then to follow it. But we reckoned that we had to get the signal from the General Assembly of the United Nations. And through persistent advocacy, simple argument of the facts, we persuaded, first of all, the G the G77, uh, low and middle income countries, uh, to get behind it. And I pay tribute to the most wonderful man in the Bangladesh mission who was calm throughout and said, don't worry, we'll get there. Um, just uh, believe me. And, and, and he did. Uh, and then when it was perfectly clear that everything was tipping in favor of the resolution, we then started to get the EU breaking apart. And I can tell you how you can break the EU apart. It was, uh, it was something I watched with enormous pleasure. And then, and then, like rats jumping back on the refloating ship, we had America and Britain and all the rest of it wanting to be associated with the campaign in its final stages. Well, I'm very glad to say that that resolution was carried by every country and unanimously. Every country backed it. And we recognized, and while we got um, a commitment, clear commitment from the UN about what uh, what would happen, we saw that as being the platform then for pushing for the meeting that took place in 2009 to talk about non-communicable disease. What we learned in that campaign was very important. We learned that many nations were sympathetic to our cause, but were anxious about promoting a single disease. So we learned the importance of collaboration uh, and led the way on forming the Non-Communicable Disease Alliance. And I'm probably committing a dreadful heresy, 
Uh, but one or two of you were probably at the Moscow meeting, uh, the Global Health Forum in, in Moscow, uh, the, and uh, where uh, Margaret Chan uh, asked me to co-chair the last session with her and then report to the ministerial meeting. Uh, and I said then that mental health is a comorbidity of diabetes and practically every other chronic disease that there is, and yet it was not within uh, the NCD alliance. It now is. But you see, I don't think the NCD Alliance should be an organization that's exclusive. I think there should be a mechanism which enables uh, every chronic disease, uh, every non-communicable disease, to be able to be associated with the movement. There is no question, there is no question that the more powerful the voice, the more it resonates among the global policymakers. And so we've progressed since then. The high-level meeting that set the scene for uh, the, the meeting in, in 2012 at which targets were adopted. And I cheered like everybody else when I heard 25 by 25, 25% reduction in, in avoidable deaths uh, by, by 2025. And I cheered when I saw that there were to be targets for the improvement and the formulation of food in order to reduce the risk factors for diabetes, for cardiovascular disease, for cancers, and so on. However, I cheered rather less when I discovered that all these targets were voluntary. And voluntary targets, ladies and gentlemen, as you well know, gives the get-out for governments that fail to honor them. Um, I saw uh, in, in Europe the St. Vincent Declaration, which was, uh, which was put together in 1989 and which set out the most wonderful list of targets in diabetes. And I hoped that they would be realized, but there were voluntary targets. And governments that appeared to sign up to them and be happy to them and to be happy with their projected outcomes then said, well, we're very sorry, we haven't managed to achieve them. Uh, end of story. What you need with targets, actually, you need to turn a voluntary target into something a deal stronger. So IDF is now doing all that it can to set up, if you like, a pincer movement between our member associations and their advocacy and specialist groups of people like our young leaders, like our parliamentarians, who will bring collective pressure upon governments. Pressure on governments to say, the world recognizes that we need to do something about this. It has set targets. We want you not to regard these targets as voluntary, but to do everything in your power to make sure that they're achieved. And they're the ones that can make it happen or not make it happen. And we can shout and we can plead our case uh, and to our dying breaths, but it's governments that actually make the changes, that force the policy initiatives and all the other things that will make a real difference. So we saw that in young leaders, we could energize a group of younger people who are quite remarkable in what they do. The discussion that took place at the last session on social media, it's, it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, outside my experience, I have to say. My kids uh, use Facebook, and I, I, hear, I hear through other people what they're doing because they've spotted them on Facebook. Um, but social media is a powerful weapon and these young people are quite remarkable in the way that they push messages out globally. They are quite remarkable in the talent and enthusiasm they show. We have young people who are nuclear scientists. We've got people who are not only highly qualified in medicine but are doing something else. And the, the connecting thread between all of them is that they have diabetes and they are proud to be champions for that disease. They're not people who go around bleating about the, the fact that fate has given them a chronic disease with potentially ser serious and fatal complications. They're people who say, I have diabetes, I will endeavor to live with it, it, is the, it, it, it will never be my master, it is my servant, but, uh, or I, will, I will, be, will not be the servant of diabetes, I will be the master of diabetes, and I have skills which I will use in a particular way uh, to help the cause. We had a young leader from the United Kingdom. He raised a six-figure sum of money to set up 
a young leader network throughout the United Kingdom, something our member association, Diabetes UK, had tried to do uh, but hadn't been successful. And it's the old story. The reason that there was success was it was a young person driving it with all the enthusiasm uh, that he could muster. Uh, and to get £150,000 to raise that uh, in, in short order, I think, confirms the talent uh, of this young person. I have found that when young people go and talk to policymakers, it has a profound effect on them because they see that passion that comes from people who know what it is like to live with a chronic condition and can speak uh, in a most eloquent way for it. And the latest uh, initiative that we have taken within IDF was to bring together parliamentary champions. I've never forgotten how I got involved in diabetes. It was purely by accident and simply because I had a child with the, with the disease. But I remember what was achieved by being able to argue my case and have access to decision makers. Uh, and believe me, there was, <laughs> in Margaret Thatcher, who was then the Prime Minister, we did have a decision maker. She listened and she acted and was a very good friend of diabetes. But I, we decided that, um, that the parliamentary champions in the world's parliaments would be one place in which we'd be able to use access to hold governments to account. So we invited parliamentarians to uh, a global forum in Melbourne. We got parliamentarians from more than 50 jurisdictions and we had another parliamentarians from another 30 or 40 who were keen to help but not able to come. It was quite a long way to go. And, and I would have to say that I'm enormously grateful to the sponsors of, of that uh, particular program. They have representatives here in Soren Scovland from Novo Nordisk and David Palacios of, uh, of Novartis, and there were others as well. And we're very grateful because they showed faith in an idea that I believe was, was uh, was coming. It's a coming idea and it's going to work. And that network is now being extended. And, and, and my ambition is that we will have parliamentarians in every jurisdiction of the world able to stand up and speak in a coordinated way when appropriate on a global issue. They will all be able to stand up and speak for diabetes so that their national government is kept constantly aware of the fact that there are targets contained in the 2012 and 2013 resolutions of the World Health Assembly, and we want to see them, uh, them honoured and honoured in full. And, and I think that the model of activation of the parliamentarians, I've been amazed, I have to say absolutely amazed, by what they have so far achieved, very much like the young leaders, when you point them in, in one particular direction, they are quite remarkable in what they've done. The Bolivian parliament has had a special session to talk about diabetes. The president of the parliament and the president of the country has sent us this beautiful elaborate uh, document in Spanish explaining what the Bolivian parliament has done uh, about diabetes. Uh, I, forgive me for focusing upon diabetes disease, but I hope that it can be an exemplar to uh, other to other disease areas. We produced a charter of rights and responsibilities for people with diabetes. Uh, as a board member, a president-elect, I was asked to produce this charter. Now, what do you think I did? What do you think, uh, how do you think you start writing a charter like that? I said, I need lively, argumentative, potentially difficult people to come and argue out what should be the rights and responsibilities of people with diabetes. So I invited Wim, I invited Durhain, and I invited Anne Felton, whom some of you will know, the, the redoubtable president of FEND. And the four of us sat in a hotel room in a hotel in uh, Heathrow Airport and cracked out this charter uh, in, in a few hours. It was remarkable how people who are spirited, spirited people who are very clear-sighted about what is needed, uh, how they could come together and agree a charter as quickly as they did. All, all of these documents are on the website www.idf.org. All of this material is available. It's available to download. 
I will be delighted if people think that it's a good thing for them to produce a charter of rights and responsibilities for people with the particular uh, disease area uh, or condition, chronic condition that you represent. There's no magic at all in it. Um, uh, indeed, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. But that, that charter sets out not just the rights, but also the responsibilities. I think when you meet policymakers and you bang the table for rights, and fail to acknowledge that people with diabetes or a condition also have responsibilities, then I think you devalue your case. If you can go and say, here are the rights that we want, but we also acknowledge that we have responsibilities, I believe we'll get a better audience. Uh, and, and that document uh, it sets out the right that people have to care, to information, to social justice absolutely against discrimination, and we find instances of it still. IDF will confront discrimination wherever and whenever it encounters it. Discrimination is fundamentally unacceptable. And I've, I, I've spoken to people here and I've seen presentations that you know the ways in which society insidiously discriminates against people uh, with, particular, with particular diseases or chronic conditions. So we confront that. And we hope that that is a charter. Again, it's part of the, it's another arrow in our quiver of uh, advocacy tools uh, to be able to be taken to, uh, to policymakers and say, here are the ways in which the rights of people with diabetes are not being properly addressed. Now let's sit down with you and talk about how we can actually address them and make change. And we have a humanitarian aid program because as most of you, I hope, will know, if you have uh, at least certainly type 1 diabetes, you need insulin to stay alive. If you don't have insulin, bluntly, you die. The discovery of insulin took place 90 years ago, over, just over 90 years ago. It is literally life-giving. Now, my child has never had any difficulty getting access to insulin, but in far too many countries of the world, there are people, children, who are diagnosed. And the family suffers the agonizing choice of buying food for the family or insulin for the child with diabetes. And often, too often, the child dies. And the child is then just a memory. IDF's humanitarian program raises money to provide insulin for children whose parents are too poor to buy it. There's no shame in being poor. The shame is a country that will spend money, um, if I could dip my toe in the murky waters of politics, a country that will spend money on arms and spend money on grandiose vanity projects and deny their citizens the right to insulin, the right to life. What a foolish, short-sighted attitude that is by any government because it's the talents of young people of all the productive years that can, uh, that can actually make that country better. And people who have well-controlled diabetes, no matter how early in life they are diagnosed, they can walk to the South Pole, they can climb Everest, they can go into space, they can achieve, they can fly single-handedly around the world as people with type 1 diabetes have done. They can achieve everything in life that they want to, but they need insulin. Therefore, our humanitarian program, which is, in my view, far too small, we're still not getting to kids who sadly die because uh, we, can't, we can't reach them. It is a fantastic program, and I have been in a clinic where the insulin was being given to the children, and the, the gratitude of the parents was both humbling and inspirational. And finally, we're actively involved uh, in the next steps. IDF's a member of the NCD Alliance, and we will play our full part in using every lobbying opportunity uh, available. But we're also an organization that is dedicated to diabetes. So at the same time, we ensure that we don't take away the focus from our disease, as you will not want to see the focus taken away from the disease or chronic condition uh, that you represent. We're determined that in building next steps, in trying to make sure that the world's policymakers honor pledges that are made, improve care, ensure that there is access to the essential medicines uh, uh, that people require. We're determined that we will keep the patient focus 
absolutely at the heart of all that we do. And I hope that when you reconvene uh, in years to come, Joe, I hope that we'll show that that collective effort that we've followed really will have brought the benefits to people uh, with, with all the different disease areas. Thank you for the privilege of being with you. my microphone on again. Um, thank you very, very much. I think that was such an inspiring masterclass, really, um, for us. Um, <laughs> I mean, we'll turn over to the audience for some reflections in a minute. For me, um, just seeing the drive, the perseverance, and a very clear goal, I think it's given me and hopefully many of us in the global patients movement some ideas, again, about how we can very, in a very focused way, target points in the system where we can have an influence. So um, I've certainly learned a lot. Um, we've got time for a few questions from the audience before we have the joint discussion. So I'm looking for some, uh, could I ask Roger first? And please, um, Roger and then Ofra, um, and then Orijit again. Okay. At dinner last night, my name is Roger Kendall from Epilepsy Here, which is a, a, a local regional organization for epilepsy. I was considering last night that neurological conditions generally seem to fit the definition of NCDs very, very clearly, and yet they seem to have a very small place in, in the NCD alliance. How can we move forward and overcome that? I thank, thank you, Roger. That's a, that's a very, very good question, in fact. Uh, and, and maybe in my answer, I will sow the seed of, uh, of, of, of action that you may be able to take. Um, I, I agree with you that uh, actually the broad area of, of, of mental health, it, which, which presents itself in so many different ways, it's a comorbidity uh, often of the other diseases in the NCD alliance. Uh, and I don't believe that the Alliance should be an exclusive organization. So when the decision, when after a, a heck of a lot of pressure from IDF, the other partners agreed that mental health had to be admitted uh, as, as, if you like, one of the core members, we looked around for an international body because the NCD Alliance operates at, at basically a, a, a supra-regional and global basis. We looked around for uh, an international body representing the spectrum of, um, of mental health. There didn't seem to be one. The nearest one we could come to was Alzheimer's um, International, as an international body. Although I do know the, the wonderful Mary Baker uh, of Brain Europe, uh, who's an outstanding lady, but um, the other partners in the NCD Alliance said that's a European organization and it has to be something that's global. And I'm quite surprised when I think about the dynamo that is Mary Baker that she hasn't gone on to conquer the world in the meantime. So perhaps there needs to be some, some global organization that is, is, if you like, more representative simply than dementia. Although it is fair to say that in relation to uh, these disease areas, the two chronic diseases which are rising are diabetes and dementia, whereas in proportionate terms, uh, cardiovascular and can cancer is holding still and, and cardiovascular is reducing uh, as the benefits of no smoking policies and things like that uh, come to bear. So perhaps what you need to do is to get, uh, there is a British Epilepsy Association, is there not? There's an International Bureau of Epilepsy. Right. Fine. Well, that's very good. Can I suggest that... Okay. Can I suggest that what you need to do is to send a message up to them, suggesting that they ally with other international groups to form a sharper focus for mental health. I, I think it's very clear that the policymakers uh, do not want to deal with single disease, but want to deal with a spectrum, a spectrum of disease, spectrum of chronic disease. Uh, I can understand why policymakers think that way, and, and, and actually I do understand and agree that it needs to be done, and it's for that reason that we've put a lot of effort into uh, trying to broker the creation of the NCD Alliance and to help it on its way.
I'm a for Balaban, I'm from Israel, so dear sir, by all means, uh, we have one thing in share. IDF in Israel, it's the Israeli Defense Forces, and you are the <laughs> Defense Forces of Diabetes. And I have two small questions, please. One, do you think that you influence more as the head of the diabetes uh, uh, forum than in politics inside, but the access you have had as a private uh, needs? This is one question, meaning what is the most um, influence from outside or from inside? This is one thing, politically. And the second one, what do you think about research about stem cell, stem cells research, just to change the insulin needs and to have some other uh, cells that can uh, produce natural one. Because we are dealing with fertility or infertility, and what we have is stem cells. Yes. Right. So let me let me let me deal with the stem cell one, which uh, I can deal with very easily. And let me tell you, this is a personal opinion. It's. Uh, I, I suspect that it would be shared by most of my fellow board members in IDF, but it's not policy of IDF, so this is a personal opinion. I would back it all the way. I would back it all the way. Uh, I, I believe that research is absolutely vital to find the causes of so many of the chronic diseases, and in finding the causes also to find the solutions. And stem cells, if stem cells can be, can be influenced to grow into a new pancreas or something like that, then I, for one, will rejoice. I, I, I do not understand, I have to say, I do not understand the fundamentalist view that says you are as God made you and uh, Allah made you uh, and, and you leave it at that. I think there are times that we've got to give God and Allah um, just a little bit of help. And the scientists in the laboratories can achieve enormous things. If it, hadn't been, if it hadn't been for the scientists in the laboratories, we'd never have discovered insulin. So I rest my case on that. Um, I, 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 I feel quite passionately about it. And when I hear people opposing stem cell research, uh, then I wonder if they're not also the same people who go to the doctor when they've got something wrong with them uh, and want to have the fruits of the discoveries of earlier research in the drugs that they're able get to get for their, for their problem. So on stem cells, I think that President Nixon was extremely foolish pandering to um, a particular view as he did in the United States against stem cell research, and I suspect that it probably lost them, uh, uh, lost them time in, in, in terms of international research on that. On the other, mat sorry, on the other matter of, of access, um, I, I believe that access, I, I believe actually that influencing policymakers comes from outside as well as inside. And that's what IDF has acknowledged with its parliamentary group, its parliamentarians uh, for diabetes, all of whom in their own parliaments are championing diabetes. The outside are people like us. They're people who have, uh, an, who, are, who have or are associated with a chronic disease or a chronic condition and who are lobbying their members of parliament or who are speaking up on television or who are getting over the message in their local media or are busy tweeting uh, the, the, the particular piece of news. Um, that's outside. And I think that they can be very powerful. When I was a member of parliament, if a group of people came to me and they had a very reasonable point of view and they could convince me uh, about it, then they had won me over as an advocate. And I could then use the access that I had to put forward the message that they'd given to me. But I also think it's very important uh, that we have people who are in the place where policymakers are held to account. And that is national parliaments, state parliaments, national assemblies, wherever health and health policy, uh, wherever it's being debated, we should have champions. Uh, they need to be briefed, they need to be given information, and they need to know that uh, the, the information we're giving them is accurate. So it's not a once and for all hit with a politician. You have to keep feeding them the information, the latest changes that are happening in the disease area, the possible research findings that influence things and so on. And what they need to do is, they need to press for a debate on the disease or, or the, the con chronic condition area 
in order that the policymakers, the minister responsible, comes before their National Assembly and gives an account of what the government's doing. And if it's not doing enough, then your champions, the people that you've briefed, should be saying, Minister, this isn't enough. You've got to try harder. As a nation, we've got to take this more seriously. We've got to start making progress. And IDF is, will, will be producing very soon a global scorecard, a scorecard for each country in which we take the pledges that the government of that country has made in signing up to uh, the targets uh, agreed at the World Health Assembly in 2012. We've got a scorecard and we're assessing the performance of each government according to what our member association tells us they're doing. And we will then use that to encourage, and, and to encourage to say, we want you to try harder. And if they're not trying hard, or they're not trying at all, we'll then shame them. We'll say to the people in the country, your government is failing you. It made a pledge. It signed up in Geneva in 2012 and 2013 to take action on these points, and it's not doing enough, uh, it's not doing enough yet to get to them. There is a target. To, uh, of access to essential medicines by 2025. 80% of the people in every country should have access to essential medicines by 2025. You can't start thinking about that at midnight uh, 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 in 2024. You've got to be planning that and building your healthcare capacity, uh, building your supply chains, finding the changes in your budget, taking money out of you know, other budgets and putting more into health. And you need to start doing that over a period of time. I happen to think that 10 years is probably a fair, a fair t length of time to make such a fundamental change. But the government has to be doing it now. And a sensible government will look to what they did in Finland when they were planning a, a, a campaign. And that was to promote a debate within the nation and to get consensus from the people. Governments are sometimes timid to act because they're not sure whether they've got the people behind them. A proper debate, a sensible debate among people in a country, agreeing, getting broad consensus about the way forward, is then a very good way of encouraging a government uh, to follow through. And, and, and Thank you, Michael. IDF will be, will be vigorous <laughs> in following that up. Sorry, I've started another <laughs> no, speech, no. Joe. <laughs> I know. I'm right. um, if I can actually um, ask you to come and join the panel now, um, I think thank we'll you. move on to some general discussion. If I can ask you to thank Michael. Thank you. Um,